Okay, hi everybody, and uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today and welcome back at Vibes, the Virtual Behavioral Economics Seminar. So this is the first uh, uh, seminar of the spring uh, schedule, and we're very excited uh, to kick things off uh, with Shengu Li from Harvard University. Shengu will tell us about the theory of exposed rationalization, which is joint work with Eric Eister and Sarah Ridu. Let me remind you quickly the logistics. So we have 45 minutes for the presentation, which will be followed by 50 minutes of Q&A. During the presentation, questions will be limited to clarifying ones, and you can ask them in the chat. During the Q&A instead, you will be able to ask your questions directly to our speaker. The seminar will be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel soon. That's all from me. Thank you, Shengbu, for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a joy to be here. It's, it's, it's an honor to get to present at Vibes. Uh, so this is, this is a paper uh, that is really about how human beings are unable to be honest with ourselves about ourselves. Uh, you know, when we look back on our mistakes, we, we rationalize, we come up with stories, that make us look better and wiser than we really are. And this is our attempt to use economic theory to get at that idea. So um, I'd like to start with, this is a quote from about 10 years into the troubles in Northern Ireland. Um, at this point, uh, you know, the IRA has been, you know, engaged in a campaign of violent resistance, resistance for about a decade. Uh, and there's this remarkable interview between a journalist and one of the senior leaders of the provisional IRA. And the journalist asks, you know, these, these, this decade of war, right? This decade of violent conflict, has it been worth it? Has the fighting been worth it? And uh, the IRA leader says, of course not. Virtually nothing has been achieved. We can't give up now and admit that men and women who were sent to their graves died for nothing. And perhaps the striking thing about this statement is its implication. The implication is if we give up now, then we have to admit that they died for nothing. But if we keep fighting, then somehow, for some reason, we don't have to admit that. And so that's an interesting phenomenon. And it, you know, it seems like that kind of reasoning is missing from the classical model. So the classical model that we all know and love, right, says that people make forward-looking choices according to time-stable preferences, right? They have some utility function, they look at the decision tree out into the future, and they take choices today that maximize their expected utility. Now, that's a good description of some behavior, but in addition to that, we often rationalize, right? We adapt our preferences to justify our past choices. And I'd like you to sort of read preferences in an expansive sense there that includes, you know, changing our goals, changing our attitudes, changing our subjective beliefs so as to justify what we've done. Now, this is not at all a new idea, right? This is maybe one of the big divergences between psychology and economics is whether, you know, economists tend to take preferences as given, psychologists tend to say preferences are constructed from our circumstances, right? But what we'd like to do is to have an economist take on rationalization. So our research question is this, um, how can we expand economic theory to include rationalization? So, what we're going to do is develop a formal theory that gets at this idea of rationalization, ex post rationalization. We're going to give you an identification theorem. We're going to argue that the primitives of the model are pinned down in a nice way. And we're going to show various comparative statics. It turns out the model is nice, it's tractable. Uh, and uh, as Annette observes, there's this uh, literature in psych and finance about escalation of losses, right? About sunk cost effects. And one of the main comparative statics of our model is getting at exactly that kind of thing, at giving a formal model that lets us think rigorously about, uh, you know, escalation of commitment or sunk cost effects. So let me jump in with a concrete example. Uh, this is uh, an old parable from Dick Thaler. Uh, you know, the thought is that uh, Bob has bought a basketball ticket for $100 for a game to be played 60 miles from his home. But he's unlucky. On the day of the game, there's a terrible snowstorm. Now, it turns out it's, it's, it's not pleasant to drive through a snowstorm to get to the game. In fact, all things considered, it's not worth driving through the snowstorm. But the story goes, Bob goes to the game anyway. 
Nonetheless, uh, if the ticket had been free, if he just received a free ticket, then he would have stayed home. Now, this is weird behavior, right? On the classical model, this doesn't make much sense. The $100 is a sunk cost. Uh, staying home or going, going to the game doesn't recover the sunk cost. All that should matter is the marginal cost of th driving through the snowstorm, and that's the same in both situations. Now, I want to just point out that intuitively, Bob's behavior seems to depend on two particular features of this example. The first feature is that Bob has made uh, an initial choice that was a mistake. So imagine we modify the example in the following way, that Bob receives a free ticket to the basketball game, but loses $100 uh, through no choice of his of his own. He has unexpected house repairs, his pipes burst. Now, it seems somewhat implausible that Bob would attend the game when he received a free ticket but lost $100 and would stay home if he had received the a free ticket and had lost nothing. So it seems important that not just that there be a cost, but that the cost have been incurred in the course of some choice that was ex post a mistake. Now, let me point out one other feature that seems important, which is that it seems important that Bob have a plausible rationale for his behavior, some explanation that can sort of make his choice make sense in hindsight. So to illustrate this, imagine if we replaced all the physical consequences of this example with money. So the thought is that Bob has bought a bet. He buys, instead of a, bas a basketball ticket, he buys a financial option that yields $180 if exercised in good weather and loses a further $20 if exercised in a snowstorm. Now, Bob's bought this option. On the day of the game, there's a snowstorm. Is it plausible, really, that Bob would exercise the option anyway in order to avoid wasting his own money? That seems, that seems odd, right? Like, it seems that faced with a choice between losing $120 or losing $100, Bob is just clearly going to choose losing $100, right? He's going to bite the loss and accept that he can't, you know, rationalize his past choice. So I've argued that there are two ingredients for Bob's behavior. First, he needs to have made a choice, an initial choice that was ex post a mistake. And second, there needs to be some plausible rationale he can give for his actions. So he can say something like, I'm not a fair weather fan. It's worth me driving through the snowstorm to support my team. And so we're going to have a model that just takes these two ingredients and sort of puts them together in a natural way. So this is the model. It's, it's, it's going to fit on a slide. Uh, we're going to deal with decision problems of this kind. First, Bob chooses an action, A1, from some menu. So you can think Bob either buys the ticket or he declines. Then he learns the state of the world. He learns either that it's sunny or it's a snowstorm. Then he chooses an action, A2, from a second menu, where that second menu can depend on his first action. So if he buys the ticket, he chooses either to attend or to stay home. If he declines, well, he's got to stay home. Now, the theory goes like this. Uh, the primitives of the theory include a set of plausible utility functions, V. Uh, these we call rationales. They are ways of assessing his entire course of action given the state. So a utility function depends on the first action, the second action, and the state. One of these rationales is special. We'll call it the material utility function U. So U is essentially, in the theory, going to represent how Bob chooses when he has no need to justify his past actions, where there weren't past choices that require justification. Now, I'm going to solve this model backwards, right? Uh, I'm going to start with the second period. Uh, having chosen some first action A1, and learn that the state is S. Bob is going to choose the second action, A2, and a rational V to maximize this thing, total utility. Now this, um, you know, I want to take a pause and point, point out some features of this. This first term over here, this is just material utility, right? So if gamma is zero, this, is, this reduces to the classical model. But this is a weighted sum of two things, and the second term, is uh, what we could call rationalization utility. Now, what is this? This compares the utility delivered under 
Bob's chosen rationale, given the state and his total course of action, to the ex post optimum under his chosen rationale, given the state. So this is like Bob thinks about which different first actions he might take and which different second actions he might take now that he knows it is snowing. Right now, some observations about this. By construction, rationalization utility is no more than zero, right? That's just because of where I've put that max. Notice that if Bob um, is making a, notice that if Bob is making, uh, if his first action was ex post materially optimal, it serves to maximize U, then we can set rationalization utility exactly equal to zero. And how would we do that? Well, we just maximize material utility and choose the rationale V equal to U. So the theory uh, is exactly coinciding with the classical prediction when Bob's first action was not an ex post mistake. But notice, if the first action was an ex post mistake, if it was ex post materially suboptimal to choose some first action, then in principle, Bob can increase rationalization utility by choosing a rationale V that is not equal to you, right? He chooses a rationale for his past course of actions, which is not equal to his material utility. But notice if he does this, then, well, which action should he choose? Which A2 should he choose? Well, he should choose an A2 that maximizes a weighted sum of rationalization utility and his chosen rationale. And so that's going to pull his, uh, it's going to pull Bob's actions away from the classical benchmark. Now, it's quite natural at this point to say, OK, that's how Bob chooses at time two. How does he choose at time one? So um, ex ante, there are perhaps two natural benchmarks. Uh, the thought is that Bob at time one has to choose an action A1 to maximize, well, expected material utility, right? There are no previous choices to justify, so he's just going to maximize material utility. But expected material utility depends on his expectation about his own second action, A2, which can depend on A1 and on the state. So this is going to depend on Bob's beliefs about himself. One natural specification is Bob is naive. He, na naivete means that Bob thinks that his future action, A2, will maximize material utility. He doesn't realize he will rationalize. Another natural benchmark is sophistication. Bob realizes that at time two, he's going to maximize total utility, and he takes this distortion into account when choosing at time one. Cool. Um, so we've got some questions about how this relates to the literature, um, and I'm going to delay that until we get to reviewing literature. Um, but let me just give you a sense for how this model works. Let me go through a worked example, right? So we've got this example with Bob in the basketball ticket. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to index the rationales by a parameter theta between 0 and 400. And the way it works is Bob gets theta utils for attending the game. He loses p utils when he pays the price of p. And he loses 200 utils when he drives through the snowstorm. Now, his material utility specifies theta is 180. What does that mean? It means that if Bob knew for sure it was going to be sunny, he would pay up to $180 to attend the game. Also, what does that mean? Well, it means that if Bob was a classical agent, he would not drive through the snowstorm because the snowstorm loses 200 utils and the material utility of attending the game is 180. Now, it turns out that this simple specification explains the examples I gave you earlier. So let's start with the baseline, the snowstorm on game day. Bob has bought the ticket, right? He's learned that it's a snowstorm, and now he must choose either to attend the game or to stay home. Now, what happens? If Bob attends the game, he, has, uh, he, he gets a material utility of 100, negative 120. Why? He gets 180 utils for attending the game. He loses 100 utils for having bought the ticket, and he loses 200 utils for driving through the snowstorm. If he attends the game, he should choose a high rationale. He should exaggerate his value for the game to achieve a rationalization utility of zero. On the other hand, if Bob stays home, what happens? Well, he's lost $100 
And it doesn't matter uh, what rationale he adopts, right? He's definitely, he's got a material utility of negative 100 because he's bought the ticket and now stays home. Uh, and he should adopt a low enough rationale, but no matter what rationale he adopts, his rationalization utility is no more than negative 100. Um, and what that means is that if gamma is big enough, um, if gamma is at least a sixth, then Bob will attend the game in the snowstorm, but if the ticket was free, he would stay home. Uh, and Ron, Ron Spiegler asks, is gamma behaviorally meaningful? That's to say, can we set gamma equals to 0.5 and rescale the Vs to get the same behavior? It turns out gamma is behaviorally meaningful. Our identification theorem uh, is going to say that we can separately pin down uh, gamma and the set cap V. Now, what happens when Bob made no initial mistake, right? So Bob didn't have a choice. He got a ticket and he lost $100 through no choice of his own. Now notice what this is, is I've deleted one of the actions at time one, right? Bob had no option but to get a ticket and lose $100. And the difference that makes is now staying home also yields a rationalization utility of zero, right? Because ex post, the first action was not a mistake. So you can set rationalization utility to zero simply by maximizing material utility. So the prediction here is that Bob stays home, right? So this gives a subtle feature of this model, which is that unlike the classical model, in this model, Bob's choice at time two can depend on time one alternatives that were not chosen, right? That Bob forgoes at time one. Now, just to cover the last one, what happens when we replace everything with money outcomes, right? So Bob has bought an option that yields $180 in good weather and loses a further 20 in a snowstorm. Well, all the rationales agree about money, right? They all agree that losing $120 is worse than losing $100. So no matter what rationale Bob adopts, his rationalization utility is minus 120 from using the option and, his material, and, his and, and, and minus 100 from refraining. So the prediction now is that Bob refrains, right? Bob can't rationalize away having bought the option because he just knows that losing $120 is worse than losing 100. So some mistakes can't be rationalized. And this gives a sense in which our model is not predicting the sunk cost effect everywhere, right? It's saying in some situations, depending on the rationales that are available, the agent responds to sunk costs. Now, you know, sort of getting to the literature, I don't want to pretend that rationalization is some new thing that we've just event invented. Psychologists have known this for a long time. Uh, this is, um, Fieri Cushman says, among psychologists, rationalization is one of the most exhaustively documented and relentlessly maligned acts in the human repertoire. And uh, just to give some of that literature, there's of course a big literature on hindsight bias, which is to say, uh, this literature finds that people assess the past from the ex post perspective. So when an event has happened, they tend to believe that they could have predicted it, that it was foreseeable. And moreover, they even misremember their own predictions. So they, uh, if you ask them who will be president, and then they observe the election and we say, did you predict that? Or how sure were you? They exaggerate the extent to which they foresaw what was coming. Um, Annette asks, are you speaking only to ex post mistakes or can you apply this to ex ante mistakes which are rationalized ex post? And yes, in principle, you might imagine that, uh, you know, you might be, you know, our agent is sort of ex ante optimal, right? Our agent is either a naive or sophisticated, but they're maximizing some utility function from an ex ante perspective. You might imagine if they tremble, right? If they have a slip of the hand, they might need to rationalize that too. And our model accommodates that in the same way as it does ex post mistakes. Um, another literature in psychology that relates to us is confabulation. This literature finds that people sometimes produce post hoc rationales and appear to sincerely believe them. So in situations where they can't remember or don't remember why they took some action, uh, people tend to invent reasons. And it's not that they invent them as lies to other people. When you query lab subjects in these situations, they appear to quite sincerely believe the thing they've just invented for themselves. And the last, uh, this is of course a massive literature on cognitive dissonance, which says roughly that people adapt their beliefs and desires for internal consistency. And in particular, faced with having made some mistake, they might 
you know, uh, change their cognitions so as to reduce the discomfort of having done something that they know to be ex post wrong. Um, now there are a lot of experiments in this literature, and I surely don't have time to go through them all, but these relate in many ways to some cost effects, which I'll get to. So in economics, of course, we've got models of rationalization as well. There's a small and quite recent literature about choosing beliefs or preferences to align with past actions. Now, um, this is a nice literature. Um, there are cool papers in it, uh, but these papers tend to be of quite specific scope. They are about particular settings like voting or belief updating or consumption decisions. And you can see one advantage of the theory I've just given you is that it has general scope. It's designed for arbitrary decision problems. Another advantage that I'll get to is that our model primitives are identified. They are pinned down by the agent's choices. And there's, of course, a big empirical literature uh, in economics on sunk cost effects, or what's sometimes called escalation of commitment. Um, now, there are lots of empirical papers on this. We find sunk cost effects in some situations, but not in other situations. Kind of crucially, there doesn't appear to be a workhorse model for dealing with sunk cost effects, right? We seem to like broadly agree that they sometimes happen, uh, but there's no simple theory that really gets at it. And so maybe one use of the theory we've given you is it's sort of reasonably transparent and tractable, and it gives us a way to think about sunk cost effects. Now, I want to round to a critique of the things I've just said. The predictions I've given you depend very crucially on the set of rationales, V. Now, our interpretation of this is that the rationales capture something psychological. They capture the plausible justifications, the stories we can tell ourselves that make sense of our past actions. Now, that's not quite good enough, right? Because what we would like is for this model to be portable, right? We'd like it to be that we can go to standard economic settings and just apply the model directly. Now, our suggestion for that is that we should use whatever restrictions are standard in that setting. If you're in a situation where there are some standard parametric restrictions on preferences, like constant relative risk aversion for money gambles, use that. Let the rationales be CRRA preferences with different coefficients. If you're modeling an auction, you know, do the usual thing, right? Say your rationales are your value for the object, just like in mechanism design. But even that's not quite satisfying, right? Because it's natural to say, hold on, those restrictions we thought made sense when we were using the classical model. And this model is using utility functions in this strange new way. Are those still the right restrictions for us to use? How would we know those are the right restrictions on the rationales? And so this rounds to the question, does choice behavior pin down the rationales? That's to say, rather than us having to rely on our own intuitions to set this, is it possible to let the data speak? to let the agent's own choices tell us how these rationales should be specified. And so let me make that question a little bit sharper and more precise. Um, how do the rationales evaluate different outcomes? So you can think of each first action as pinning down a menu of outcomes, as selecting a menu. So buying a ticket is selecting a menu with two options. Either you attend the game and pay $100 or you stay home and pay $100. And declining to buy the ticket is choosing a singleton menu where the only option is to stay home and pay nothing. Now, um, we're gonna need to enrich this space a little bit. What we'll do is we'll replace the outcomes with lotteries over outcomes. Now, these are, are quite simple lotteries, right? What have I done here? Uh, it, now it's as though when Bob goes out intending to go to the game and he tries to start his car, half the time the car doesn't start and he has to stay home anyway. Right, so this is a simple lottery. It's, it's not state contingent, it's independent of the state. It's just a lottery over the outcomes he might face. And so here's the identification problem that we're gonna have to be faced with, right? We are given finitely many outcomes, cap Z. So think of these outcomes as objects like attend the game and pay $100 or stay home and pay nothing. And there is some unknown set of rationales where each rationale depends on the outcome and the state. There are lotteries over these outcomes, and we will extend these rationales by taking expectations. And our agent is going to face decision problems of this kind. First, she chooses a finite menu of lotteries M from a finite collection of menus script M. Then she learns the state. 
then she chooses a lottery from the menu. So here our agent chooses between the menu BC and the menu DEF. Then she learns the state. Then she, you know, if she chose the menu BC, she chooses between B or C. Now you might recognize this looks very similar to the formalism of Gould and Pessendorfer for temptation. Uh, the only difference is that our agent learns a state of the world in between. And of course, our theory is a different theory. So, you know, identification needs to pr proceed differently. Now we're going to take as data time two choices for all collections script M and all menus in that collection. Now I want to emphasize this is a truly ludicrous amount of data, right? This is not a practical cookbook for eliciting preferences. We are answering the following question. If we had a complete description of the agent's choice behavior, well, in the classical model, we know that is enough to pin down the utility function. And we are asking similarly here, given a complete description of the agent's choice behavior in this ex post rationalization model, is that enough to pin down the rationales and the other relevant primitives? Okay, so we're taking a revealed preference approach, really revealed preferences, because there's more than one utility function we need to identify. So notice, after the agent's chosen a, chosen a menu, she could, by choosing differently at time one, have achieved any lottery in the union over that collection of menus, right? The union over script M. So we're going to have as this object a time two choice correspondence, C2S. This is how the agent chooses at time two in state S. We're going to say it's represented by a tuple, gamma USVS. So gamma is the weight on rationalization utility. US is the material utility assessed in state S. VS are the rationales assessed in state S. And so the agent's time to choice correspondence, this thing, C2S, right? How she chooses from menu M, given that she initially faced the collection script M, we're going to say it's represented by the tupo. If it's equal to, that's the same thing written out as before, total utility, the argmax of total utility with respect to the lotteries the max with respect to the rationales right, of that same object. So what are we doing here? Right? We're saying we don't get to see directly the agent's reason for her actions. Right? You know, we're not going to trust self-reports that our agents give us. All that is real for us right now is choice. We see for each collection and each menu in that collection how the agent would choose at time two. Now, I want to just observe that this argmax is invariant to certain ways we might tweak the representation. Certain transformations don't change the argmax. For instance, you might imagine that I multiply every rationale by the same positive alpha. So every rationale is multiplied by the same positive constant, including material utility. Now, notice if I do this, all I've done is I've multiplied the entire objective function by a positive constant, that makes no difference to how the agent should choose her action. Another thing I could do is I could take just one of the rationales and I could add a positive, con well, a, a constant positive or negative beta, right? Now notice the way total utility is constructed when I do this, well, I add beta, I subtract beta, it makes no difference. The agent is no more or less likely to choose that rationale when I add a constant to it. Now, it turns out that under some conditions that I'll get to, the representation is unique up to exactly these two transformations. These are the only transformations that you can make without changing the agent's choices. So that's the theorem, that the Choice that the for any choice correspondence that's consistent with our theory, it has if the choice correspondence C2S has regular representations, a red representation and a blue representation, then first those two representations have exactly the same gamma. The red gamma and the blue gamma are the same. So this gets to Ran's question of whether gamma is separately identified. And the second is that the rationales are unique up to a positive affine transformation. That's to say there exists a positive scale factor alpha and a vector of 
additive terms beta, such that when I take, when I transform the blue rationales using this affine transformation, I get the red rationales. And when I transform the blue material utility with this, I get the red material utility. Now, a lot rides on what is regular. So this is what regular means. A representation is regular if first gamma is strictly more than zero and strictly less than one. Why do we need that? Well, if gamma is zero, then the rationales don't matter. They aren't identified. If gamma is one, then material utility doesn't matter. It's not identified. Secondly, we require that, remember, each rationale, this being an expected utility preference, is a vector specifying one real number for each outcome. So I'm going to require that the set of rationales, right, the set of vectors is compact, convex, and not singleton. We're going to require that material utility is in the relative interior of this set. And what does that mean? That means that if Bob can exaggerate his value for going to the game, he can at least slightly downplay his value. Or more generally, if Bob can distort his rationale in one direction away from material utility, he can distort it by at least epsilon in the other direction. And the fourth requirement is kind of non-redundancy. It says no two distinct utilities in the set of rationales induce the same preference over lotteries. Now, why do I call this non-redundancy? Well, imagine that the set VS included kind of duplicates. It included a blue rationale VS and a red rationale that was just equal to the blue rationale times two. Now, whenever Bob was adopting the red rationale, he would be weakly better off switching to the blue rationale, right? Because this would weakly increase rationalization utility and thus total utility. What that means is that even if we were to delete the red rationale, that would make no difference to how Bob chooses, right? The scaled up version of the blue rationale is irrelevant to his choice behavior. So non-redundancy essentially says, you know, for the sake of neatness, let's imagine we trim off all of those decorative rationales that don't matter for choice. That's to say we're going to, in each, you know, whenever there are two rationales that represent the same preference, let's delete them and keep the weaker one. Cool? So under these conditions, the theorem says basically that a complete description of choice behavior is enough to pin down the model. Right, so just as we can talk about revealed preference in the classical model, we can talk about revealed rationales here. The data can speak to us for what rationalizations the agent can adopt. Now, I want to critique that further because there's a sense in which what we've just done is unreasonable. Some time two choices are off the path of play and our theorem was cheating by peeking at those choices. What do I mean by that? Well, the last theorem used all time two choices as data, all finite collections of finite menus, all menus in those collections. And it might be ex ante suboptimal to choose some menu M from some collection script M. So how on earth can we know how the agent would choose in that counterfactual? One interpretation of our theorem is that we are observing what happens after the agent trembles, right? Picking up an earlier thread, sometimes the agent has a slip of the hand, right? Accidentally chooses something wrong at time one, and now we're seeing how she would choose even in those situations. But it turns out that if you allow the menus to be a little bit richer, then in fact, even if we restrict attention to on-path choices, to choices that are ex ante optimal for a naive or for a sophisticate, those are sufficient for identification. And the key there is just to allow menus to de depend on a certain kind of payoff irrelevant horse race. So even though I was entitling myself to a truly ludicrous amount of data early on in stating that theorem, in fact, it turns out if you trim down and say you only get to observe on path choices, uh, you still get identification. Now, having done this at a sort of quite high level of generality, what I actually want to do now is to zoom in to the sunk cost effect, right? Because one interesting thing about this model is it seemed to produce the sunk cost effect in that classic example from Thaler's 1980 paper. Is that like special because of the particular structure, the particular functional form of the rationales that we adopted? Or is this some general observation? 
And I'm going to argue that this is, in fact, a general feature of this model, that in certain kinds of decision problems with complements, the sunk cost effect always arises. And in fact, other related effects that you see are close cousins. So what do I mean by a decision problem with complements? I mean a problem where, in essence, raising the first action increases the gains from raising the second action and vice versa, and raising the rationale increases the gains from raising either of the actions. So think of this like buying a ticket is a complement to going to the game. And the higher your value for the game, the more you should buy a ticket and the more you should go to the game. You might imagine we've got a two-part project where your time one effort and time two effort are complements and your rationales are your value for succeeding in the project. You might imagine that we've got belief elicitation. We're going to elicit the agents prior, then we're going to show her a signal, we're going to elicit her posterior, and her rationales are her prior about the state, her actual prior she gets to manipulate. Or you might imagine a two-part tariff. The agent chooses either to pay an upfront fee or decline, if she pays the fee, then she gets to choose what quantity to consume. And her rationales are her taste for the product, how much her marginal utility for consumption. Now, you know, this general thing, uh, and I've got, there are some questions in the chat that we'll hopefully get to um, a little later. Uh, so what have we got here? We've got these supermodular decision problems where what we want to do is to compare rationalizers to classical agents. Now, in a supermodular decision problem, the first actions and the second actions are totally ordered sets. Theta is a parameter set, also totally ordered. And we've got a function W, which depends on the first action, the second action, theta, and the state, which is supermodular in the first three arguments. And the rationales just have the form where the agent chooses which theta she has. She chooses her value for the game. She chooses her value for the project. She chooses her marginal utility of consumption facing a two-part tariff. Now, a little bit more structure. Um, if it's been a while since you did monotone comparative statics, just a reminder, I'm going to say that a set X is no more than a set Y in the strong set order if for any little x and little y, we have that their uh, meat is in the smaller set and their, and their join is in the bigger set. And so that's just a way of ordering sets. I'm going to require that the second menu is non-decreasing is non in the first action. That's to say, when I raise the first action, the second menu increases in the strong set order. So when I buy the ticket instead of declining, I get a higher menu. Now my menu includes the option to go to the game as well as to stay home. We're going to assume that relevant maxima exists, you know, the usual continuity and compactness stuff. So a little warm up, comparative statics. Uh, it turns out that Topkiss theorem for supermodular decision problems gives a neat comparative static for classical agents. When I raise their first action, their second action goes up. Now it's pretty straightforward to check. These also hold for rationalizers. So for any supermodular decision problem, uh, the rationalizer's choices from the second menu are non-decreasing in his first action. Okay, so that's just, you know, observation, there's a neat comparative static that is preserved by our model. But the thing that we're really interested in is not just this. What we want to know is what kinds of deviations from the classical model do we expect when we have an ex post rationalizer? And so it turns out that in these supermodular problems, some cost effects are part of a much bigger phenomenon, um, which is this. Let's say, let's call an action A1 ex post too high in some state S if it's at least A1 star, where A1 star maximizes material utility in state S. So it turns out, as you can see from the graph, when you are to the right of A1 star, when your first action was ex post too high, the rationalizer picks higher second actions than a classical agent would. And when you're to the left of A1 star, so your first action was ex post too low, the rationalizer picks lower actions than a classical agent would. And so that's the theorem. The theorem says for any supermodular decision problem, any first action in any state, if the first action was ex post too high in that state, then the rationalizer's choices 
from the second menu are higher than the materially optimal choices in the strong set order and symmetrically if they were too low. Another way of thinking about this theorem, remember, is that our agent behaves exactly like the classical agent if she had no choice at time one, if her time one menu was singleton. So this is saying, let's compare the agent after making a choice to how she would have behaved if she had just been endowed with that choice through no choice of her own, right? If she'd just been endowed with A1 and there were no alternatives. And this says, when the first action was too high, ex post, then she's distorted upwards compared to the situation where she was just endowed with her first action. And similarly, if it was too low. So what does this give us, right? We had that basketball ticket example, right? Which you can see is a super modular decision problem. Um, when Bob has bought the ticket, his first action in the snowstorm, it turns out he shouldn't have bought the ticket. His first action was ex post too high. How does he respond? He goes to the game when he should stay home. His second action is distorted upwards. In a two-part project, right? You may imagine that the project succeeds with a probability A1 times A2, in which case Bob gets a prize of theta. And he's got a cost function that is separable across time, where the Cost, the state S is a cost shock for time one. Now, if it turns out that time one effort was unexpectedly costly, well, for a rationalizing agent, it doesn't matter what the time one cost shock is, that's a sunk cost, right? Even if you discover it, it was just really hard at time one, too late, you've paid that cost. But for a rationalizer, when that shock was high, it was a mistake to put in so much effort at time one. And so our agent, escalates her commitment. She puts in more effort at time two when time one effort was unexpectedly costly. Now, it turns out that the model doesn't even need, the, 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 ration, the rationales themselves can be time separable and we can still get distortions. So this example is imagine the agent makes the same decision twice. So there's some supermodular function H, supermodular in, A, in the action and the type, uh, the, the, you know, the theta, the parameter, and the agent just chooses an action, then she learns the state, then she faces the same problem again and chooses an action again. Now, for a classical agent, that's easy, right? You just, you know, you choose the expected optimal action at time one and you choose the ex post optimal action at time two. For our agent, her choices are sticky. When she chose too high before learning information, her choices are distorted upwards, even after she learns the information. And in particular, you might imagine that H is like some sort of, you know, scoring rule in an experiment. You ask the agent to report her prior. You show her a noisy signal of the state. Theta is her prior that she gets to manipulate. And then you ask her to report her posterior. That fits into this framework. Um, what happens when her prior was too high given the signal? she distorts her posterior upwards compared to say an agent who was never asked for her prior in the first place. And of course, overconsumption with two part tariffs, what do I mean? You choose whether or not to pay money for the buffet lunch. Then you learn whether or not the lunch is any good, whether the food is palatable. Sometimes the food is not good and it was a mistake to have paid the money at the door. Uh, well, what happens? Well, you have made a ex post too high action at time one. You're going to distort your action upwards at time two. You're going to eat so that you get your money's worth. Um, cool. So those are some applications of the theorem. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to bring us back to the classical literature. Um, the earliest instance of rationalization I can find is in the Iliad, uh, where Odysseus uh, is delivering a speech to the Achaean army at the siege of Troy. So at this point, the Achaeans, they've camped out on the beach next to their ships in front of Troy for nine years, besieging the city. And it's been a long time and they want to go home. They thought they'd have won a long time ago. And Odysseus tries to rally them. He says, this is the ninth year come round, the ninth we've hung on here. Who could blame the Achaeans for chafing, bridling beside the beaked ships? Ah, but still. What a humiliation it would be to hold out so long, then sail home empty-handed. Courage, my friends, hold out a little longer. 
And then he proceeds to offer his rationale. He says, uh, remember, we received a prophecy that victory would come in the ninth year. And we should stay on now to see if the prophecy is true or false. And of course, you know what happens after that. We get the whole rest of the Iliad. Anyway, uh, so that's to say this is not uh, a new phenomenon. This is a new theory of really a very old thing. Um, one neat thing about it is it seems to give us a clean, reasonably tractable way to deal with sunk cost effects. Another neat thing about it is that the rationales are just identified by choices, right? They, 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 they are not a question of the modeler's intuition. They can ultimately be something where we can let the data speak. And if you impose this natural complementarity structure, which applies to some problems, then you get some really quite nice, quite clean deviations from the classical benchmark. Um, and that's, that's, that's all I had to say. Uh, and uh, you know, let's, let's open for questions. Annette? Wonderful. Uh, yes, let's, let's start the Q&A. Please, uh, you can raise your hand or not, uh, and mute yourself and ask the question directly. Annette, go ahead. Hey, that was, that was super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a quick question, which may be a little bit silly, is more or less a confirmation. Am I understanding correctly that exposed, max, uh, that exposed rationalization is well for increasing and we should not be keeping from people, people, uh, people from doing it? So this isn't like present bias while you have this time zero agent who wishes that the person wasn't present bias. This is more like you're actually getting 300 utils now from the baseball game instead of 180, right? So this is a good thing to do. That's, that's a great question, and um, there's a subtlety here, right? Because our agent is, in principle, could be time inconsistent, right? It could be that our agent takes and, you know, at time one, thinks differently about his choices than at time two. So we run into the usual problem in behavioral welfare economics, which is which utility function should take, you know, precedent. And it's not obvious to us which these are, right? Um, and and it, I think that's a really interesting open question I don't have a good answer, but it's, it's, you know, it is a tension in the model. Um, we have a question from Ron that I actually want to pick up on, where Ron says, could you please discuss the interpretation of convex cap V, convex rationales? Does it correspond to mixing between basic rationales? Um, and he comments, this is a bit like mixing excuses for showing up late to work. The nanny was a bit late and there was traffic. And that's not a good kind of excuse. Sometimes when you're giving an excuse, you better stick to one. And I think Ron's exactly right. Like the, so convexity in a formal sense is just there to give us sort of a nice tractable set we can use for identification. But substantively what it's saying is that if the agent thinks that one thing is a good justification for his action and another thing is also a good justification, then the 50-50 of those things is also a good justification. That is sometimes plausible and sometimes not, right? You can get preferences that are a bit like, you know, Marmite, right? You either love Marmite or you hate it. Nobody is just okay with it. Um, and our identification theorem does, is ruling out those kinds of preferences. It's saying whenever two reasons for your action seems pl seem plausible to you, you can also convince yourself of their mixture. Annette? Do you, do you have another question or is that I'm having trouble keeping track of hands? Or Gabriel, oh, you've I'm, also I'm got sorry. a question. Yes, um, yeah, thank you for the super um, interesting talk. Uh, it was very exciting to me, especially as I am working uh, on uh, choice blindness about confabulation and all that. So it felt very, um, uh, very close to me, uh, why people confabulate and The choice blindness stuff is, is, is so yeah. cool. Like that, yeah. that, that literature, I mean, I, I was amazed to find that literature. It's mm -hmm. just, I, I was shocked that people have this, but ex post, it seems plausible that they do it. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's quite, quite fun to, to work on it. Uh, but um, I was wondering, so what's, uh, I found your model very interesting, although the technical details are a bit uh, hard for me uh, sometimes to understand. But I was wondering, you know, in, in choice blindness, we've also seen that, uh, so we lead people to illusory think that they made choices they never made. And we've also, and then they confabulate, but we also see that um, then their preference change in line with their confabulations and their illusory, illusory beliefs. And mm -hmm. in this situation of preference change, uh, we don't have the kind of, let's say, economic, so to speak, incentives that we have in the situation you describe. And I was wondering, do you have any idea how your model could be 
applied to this kind of preference change through choice blindness. So to speak. Right. So, so, so you might imagine. Um, so, so let, let me decompose that because I think there are two important changes you would make to accommodate that. The first is that ours is a model of perfect recall, right? Our agent remembers, well, he at least remembers what he chose at time one. Mm -hmm. Whereas choice blindness is much more like the agent is forgot or was mistaken about what he chose. Mm -hmm. Right now, our model is in principle well-defined. If you can tell me the agent's mistaken memory, our model spits out a prediction in just the same way as before. But that's one modification you would need to make to bridge that gap. The second modification is to say, well, how is the agent, you know, how should we think about sort of unincentivized choices, right? Because our model is all about rationales, right? Our agent is responding to incentives. And you might imagine saying to, you know, that our agent is facing a question where she's being asked, what was your reason for acting? And she faces a small, like an epsilon cost for lying, right? And mm -hmm. so she's facing a sort of small incentivized cost for reporting her past reason for action. But that will fit quite neatly in our framework, right? Because that's sort of like saying, you know, you made a choice, you're mistaken about that choice. Now you need to justify it, right? Being asked, why did you act or how did you think about it is like being asked to justify your past choice. And if you sort of have a small lying cost, that's enough to say that the agent will be distorted by misremembering her past choice. Hmm. Okay. In interesting. Uh, I will have to, to, to think about it <laughs> a bit more. Um, okay. Very interesting. Thanks. Ivan? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, in, to continue the theme of previous two questions, uh, one interpretation that I very liked in this work is not in terms of uh, behavioral economics of individual person, but kind of behavioral economics of organization. So uh, it also reminds me that not the story of Troy, uh, sirens and uh, sieges and st things like that, but uh, of Texas sharpshooters that you first uh, make a uh, uh, decision where you want to hit and then you hit it or you do it vice versa. And sometimes organization do it uh, in a similar way that you first influence uh, criteria for evaluation and then when evaluations come you are more happy than uh, previous but uh, you uh, make the distinction between naive uh, first period decision making and sophisticated uh, first period decision making uh, so my question is uh, 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 first of all please uh, in more detail what is the difference and how they mix together for for example and second how you might approach identifying it from the data or um, something like that right Thanks. so 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 that's a great question um so the thought is that you know the question here is really between naives and sophisticates about how transparent our own behavior is to ourselves right like one view is that we know ahead of time that we will rationalize. We understand the distortions we will make, even ex ante. And so that's a sophisticate that says, look, you know, I'm going to account for the fact that if I buy this ticket, I'm going to feel like I need to go to the basketball game, even in a snowstorm. And I want to account for that when I buy the ticket. I'm going to, you know, count that as a loss at the point where I buy the ticket. Whereas a naive is like, the, he says, you know, he sort of is blissfully unaware. He thinks that he's got a stable preference relation, right? It's the thing that is induced by his material utility and he's just gonna fight on. And so if you're in the context of an organization, right? Like in an organization, an interpretation of our model is that the set of rationales is not justifications you offer yourself, it's justifications you offer other people, right? So like in this quote, right? It's not necessarily that Odysseus is trying to convince himself or even the army, he's saying, think about what the people back home will say if we go home having fought for nine years and then come back with nothing, right? We need to find the reason we can offer them for why we were away for nine years. And that's why we need to fight on. And so in those circumstances, sophistication feels more right, right? You, are, you, you, you understand the things that the audience will take as plausible reasons for your actions and you distort accordingly. Right now, as to how you would identify these, I guess that's the thing, right? You would need something about time one behavior in order to identify these, right? So our models, our identification theorem says you can fully figure out the set of rationales for time two. 
And then once you have that, they're going to create different implications for time one behavior, which you can then tell apart, right? Um, but one example of this, for instance, is that a sophisticate might demand commitment, right? A sophisticate might say, I understand at time one that if I buy this ticket, I'm going to feel like I need to go to the game even when it's snowing and that sucks. And so one thing the sophisticate might do is he might choose to buy a weather contingent ticket. He might choose to buy tickets that only work in the sunshine. Johannes? Uh, hi, uh, thanks a lot for the for the very interesting talk. Um, so I, I have a, a question about kind of different ways through which you capture kind of classic classic um, classic agents, uh, non-exposed rationalizing agents. So understand kind of when gamma is equal to zero, you get a, a classic utility maximizer. But but it seems to me kind of also if you if you play around a bit with the normalization, uh, you could also get that. No, right? If if you have an agent who say kind of forgives herself her her past error because yes. she understands that that I couldn't have known, and you kind of keep the normalization only maximizing with uh, kind of the A two choice, not with the A one choice. Kind of yeah. then it seems like you would also get a rational yeah. agent, right? Or are these absolutely? Kind of two let ways me let me scroll back to that way, so that. For, for, for people who, who, who don't have your same photographic memory. Uh, Making notes. <laughs> right, we've got this. Uh, yeah. So yeah, totally, right? Th th there are a lot of features of this that if you removed would revert to the classical model, right? If you removed the first line of that max over there, we're back to the classical model, right? This, this model yes. becomes observationally equivalent to the classical model. Um, another thing that you can do to make this revert to the classical model is you can uh, make the set cap V singleton, right? If you can have no room to distort your rationales, then you behave like a classical agent again. A, a, th a third thing you can do to make this like the classical model is you can make uh, the rationales include one that is a constant function. So this is like our, our uh, agent is a Zen Buddhist, right? Our agent can adopt a stoic rationale that says, you know, I am indifferent between all things. And if she does that, then she can set the second term to zero all the time. Thank you, very interesting. Antonio? Hi, um, very nice seminar. Thank you, Shingu. Um, I'm wondering, so many people have asked about the connection with the, with the classical model, but are there ways to distinguish from, from other non-classical models like empirically? So I guess lots of people here do experiments, so they would like to just go ahead and um, raise yourself, your, your model against some other thing that might explain some, uh, some issues. Have you thought about that at all? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, I, yes, yes. That's, that, that's a great question. Um, I am, you know, so I'm working with, uh, Kirby Nielsen and Sarah Rideout about a little experiment where we're trying to do exactly this. So it turns out that one key prediction that shows up in our model, but none of the, not, not none of the sort of big behavioral theories is that the agent's time two choice can depend on foregone alternatives at time one. So remember this distinction where all I'm doing is I'm deleting uh, one of the options at time one. Now, our model says that deleting options at time one changes which rationales the agent offers to herself, which changes her time two action. But none of the classical theories that I'm aware of, or indeed any of the behavioral theories, right? Like, you know, the big ones like, you know, expectations-based reference dependence, right, prospect theory, they don't have this dependence on unchosen alternatives in the same way, right? And similarly with sort of classical regret theory is all about the forward-looking regret, right? So, you know, sort of Loons and Sugden style regret theory says at time one, I'm going to distort my actions, but it doesn't have this retrospective angle that sort of deleting past actions changes my behavior. And so you might imagine sort of experiments that alter the choice set without altering the first choice, right? If you do this carefully, there are ways to do that. Um, and when this happens, that's a smoking gun that falsifies the other models, right? When deleting an unchosen first action changes your time to choice. So in a sense, can we think of this as a, as a backward looking regret model? So I should hmm. have chosen this, I hate it, and then I'm going to choose something that makes it, you know, so that in fact, sour grapes, you know, this person could 
Absolutely. Like so 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 the the, the, the thought is in some sense this model is the complement to Looms and Sugden, right? Looms and Sugden says, I choose today so that tomorrow I don't feel regret. Uh, this model says, I look back on yesterday, I feel regret for the things I've done. To diminish that regret, I rationalize and that changes what I do today. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, it's five in London. So thank you so much, Shengu, for a fantastic presentation and for dealing single-handedly with all the questions in the chat. Thank you everybody for, for joining. And we're gonna reconvene in two weeks with uh, Natalie Lee from uh, Amsterdam. Thank you for having me. It's, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to get to see you all. Um, you know, stay well uh, and catch you around. Thank you very much, Shangu. Thank you, everybody. Cheers.